All right. You guys ready to get going? Lance, gonna... you're still here. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for any reason to just postpone as much as I can. We have a bunch of guests over here, so I know there's only uh, seven pictures of people, but uh, we've got, uh, we got Rufus back there, and then intern one, intern two, and intern three, and Jason, and his shiny bald head. <laughs> <laughs> and Danny's here. This is, this, he looks great. He's true. You just get that haircut. Oh, man. Um, Danny, since this is the first time I've seen you here, do you have, first of all, the rule that you need to know is if you're not talking, I need you to mute your speaker or your microphone. <clears throat> also, do you have a question? Would you like to lead us off? Do you have any, anything that maybe oh, you need man. to ask? Bill in public yeah. in front of people? I do. Um, so let me pull my notes here. So reading the Bosch book again, still. Um, Are you on calling page from heaven? Huh? Are you calling from heaven? Your screen looks like you're like glowing or something. It, it might as well be, Bill. <laughs> All right. um, so they're talking. I'm, I'm past the attractors and fluctuators part. Mm -hmm. um, but now they're talking about it like in sport. So one thing that they're saying is the greater the contextual variability, the problem the central nervous system has to solve and the more stability based, uh, uh, based on self -or organization or attractors will be required. So my, so my thinking is digging out more attractors means I'm putting more tools in the toolbox for my athlete. I don't know what you mean by that. that you're speaking in, in buzzwords, I don't know what you mean. Speak, speak, speak in English. Well, like you actually can't understand me or like is a problem with my mic? No, you're speaking in buzzwords. Okay. Like, give me something, say, ask me a question with a meaning to it, bud. So. When you say tools and toolbox, I have no idea what you're talking about. If I give my, if I'm digging out in what Bosch is calling more attractors, I am giving my athlete more options. <clears throat> so attractors are, are more stable components of, of a particular behavior. Mm -hmm. okay. So we were talking about what we we're talking about, baseball swing or golf swing, I can't remember. We were talking about baseball. Baseball, okay. So there are elements of a baseball swing that are, that are absolute, that everybody that swings a bat will, will execute, right? And those are the attractors. And so what he's saying is, is that the, the more variable the, the context of the, uh, the, the combination of, of environment and task, which would be your context, okay? Um, environment providing the greatest element of context. The more variable that is, the more attractors there will be, which, which makes the behavior more stable in that environment. Let me give you an example. Um, if you're walking on a treadmill at three miles an hour, the, the environment is creating this, this behavior that has to be maintained. You have to walk it three miles per hour or you will fall off the treadmill, okay? So your, your, your walking is now essentially a stable uh, configuration to meet the demands of walking at three miles per hour in the treadmill, right? So there, there'll be very specific elements of, of your gait that have to meet those demands and those will be the attractors, okay? If I increase the speed of the treadmill to four miles per hour, that means we go from three to four. As I increase the speed, you will have to destabilize that behavior, become very unstable, okay? 
So it's, it's, essential, it's essential instability. You have to change the state. You can no longer walk at three miles per hour if the treadmill is now going at three and a half miles per hour. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So to go from, from three to three and a half, right, you have to destabilize, right? So you cannot be in, a tr in an attractor state, right? If, if I change the environment, in which you're behaving. So I altered the, the complexity. I make it more variable. So I'm increasing the speed. As I increase the speed, you better destabilize or you're gonna crash. When I get it up to four miles per hour and I leave it there, you and as long as you walk four miles per hour, you will again reach a stable state that meets the demands of walking four miles per hour. Okay? So, um, again, it's just a matter of, of uh, the greater the complexity, the more attractors that you'll have to have. That's basically what he's stating, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's, just, that's just more elements that you have to attend to. So I'm not sure what you mean when you say that, that you're giving them more tools in the toolbox. I would say that if I'm understanding you, and if I'm wanting to try to speak your language, I would say you have to have more tools in the toolbox. You're not giving them more. You have to have them. Just stay on the treadmill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I'm understanding you, I'm not really sure what you're asking, but I think I, I think I, think I was. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Well, I don't know if I answered your question or not. So no, no, it definitely made more sense. Okay. Okay. Who's next? Newbies, Chris Wykus, how are you? We got newbies. Who's new? Batman's over here. Chris, you're muted. Yeah, I'm. I'm muted now, right? Is Wykus yeah, here? You're good. Hello. Yeah. Hi. I just okay. had dinner with uh, Pat and Derek. They say hello. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm back to them. It's a good looking beard, young man. Yeah, man, it's, uh, it's coming in. It's November and all. Um, I guess we could probably talk about what you and I spoke about earlier today, Bill. That well, would probably be beneficial. What it was. It, what was. It, we, uh, we were speaking about infrasternal angle in relation to infrapubic angle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the, just the, based on like the little research I had done, we were talking about women tend to have um, mm -hmm. wider and, and men narrower. I guess right. maybe just to talk about the relationship of that, maybe? Okay, okay. Well, I, so, so it stands to reason that if I'm gonna pass a, a, another human through my pelvis, I need a bigger hole, right? Yeah. Okay. So that right there implies that the, 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 the outgoing element of the pelvis, the outlet has to be bigger right, which inherently would have a wider infrasternal angle. But where, I, where I, I don't know if we were making the connection or not since we were going back on, on uh, 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 Facebook, but uh, what, I, what I was trying to make the point is like, look at it at, at within one human, don't make the comparison between two humans and then try to say one is wider and one is narrower. Yeah, yeah. You have, you have to look at their, their, their own um, and when we're making this judgment. So for instance, I could have, I could have a woman with a a narrow infrasternal angle and therefore a narrow infrapubic angle, but it could still be wider than a man's because right. relative. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So we 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 always have to look at the individual. We can't we can't make the comparison between two people and say, oh, yours is narrow, yours is wide, other than maybe like making like a, a like a true measurement, like a we throw the goni and we lay it on their on their rib cage and we say, "Oh, your angle is this based on my measurement." Um, right. right. And I and I and I I didn't know if I, I was making that point or not. It was um, yeah. I I I was understanding that. I guess I was thinking about it further. And if I mean I may be getting this incorrect, but if part of the reason why the infrasternal angle narrows is the the diaphragm continues to descend and it starts to bring. It starts to bring the ribs in. Yeah. Uh, is am I getting a pelvic floor that's also descending and bringing a pelvic a infrapubic angle in? Is is hey. it that? 
That's a really great way to look at it. Yeah. Is that, is that the, where that relationship lies? Yeah, so, so think, think about this for a sec. Um, so uh, um, it, when I say nutation and counter nutation, you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. Yes. Right. So um, what, what you'll find in, in the circumstance of people with a narrow infrasternal angle, they will have a counter nutated sacrum in, in almost every circumstance so far. Um, I'm trying to think if I had any exceptions yet, and, I, and, and it could just be my bias that I'm saying it's not even possible. But, um, but no, so, so if, if, I, if I narrow the infrapubic angle, I am bringing the, uh, uh, the I'm closing the uh, outlet of the pelvis, right, which is a descended position of the pelvic diaphragm, right? So it's, it's, an, it's an inhalation um, uh, structure, it's structured for inhalation under those circumstances. Um, and so it will be descended, right? Um, but think about this for a second. You're also counter mutating the sacrum at the same time, right? And so what pulls the apex of the sacrum forward to counter mutate it in the first place? It's going to be the pelvic diaphragm muscles that are actually attached to the, uh, the infrapubic angle, right? And so as they, as they pull the apex of the sacrum forward, they're also going to pull the infrapubic angle narrow, just like the diaphragm pulling the infrasternal angle narrow. And so, you know, this brings up a cool little subject that, you know, once the, the human physiology discovered something that worked, it used it over and over and over again. And so, so we will see this whole thing repeat itself all over the place, right? You'll see, you know, the clavicles will be more angular in the people with the narrow infrasternal angles, right? Would you see that at like the sphenoid, you think? Um, that's a good question. I've never actually seen a sphenoid, so I don't really. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it, that'd be a tough one to to, to measure. But yeah, cat scan. Yeah. <laughs> well, what you may see is is like a, a really narrow palate, right? Okay. So that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and so that would be yeah, and so so that would be uh, indicative, right? Um, so yeah, I would think, and then you know you, you look at the. Um, Look at the really extreme. So, so you're really lanky, tall, slim females will tend to have a very narrow head as well. So again, it just, like I said, this whole thing just kind of repeats itself over and over and over yeah. again, you know? Um, so does that address? Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, just the understanding that relationship. Because if you're like trying to reduce what you look at in terms of assessment, to like just that axial, you know, segment. Yeah. And you're just looking at an infrasternal angle. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it's like, have, you have time. If you put a gun to my head and give me one test, that's what I'm going to do. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, and it, it just, just consider all the connections to the diaphragm, you know, um, it's everywhere, right? Yeah. Especially through the, the, the axial skeleton. And then, you know, you could consider that it extends beyond that. If you look at the, I mean, if, you, if you're a, a believer in, in chains of any kind, whether they be muscle chains or fascial chains or however anybody wants to look at that, um, you know, you could just say that it's connected everywhere. And so where, where is that most prominent as to what, what it's doing? It's like, you know, it's right there. It's the closest measurement that I have to, to give me the truest diaphragm position. So yeah. it stands to reason that, okay, it's all going to go from there. Cool. Thanks, Bill. Patrick Song to everyone. Just to clarify, Bill said narrow. Patrick, speak up. I didn't want to interrupt, but yeah, I just I just wanted to just clarify that point. We were talking about narrow infrasternal angles. Yeah, but that's what the that's the what you were talking about, right? I know you're talking about infrasternal angle and infrapubic angle, and then you mentioned that narrow. Every time you get a narrow infrasternal angle, you seem to also get a counter-nutated sacrum. Yep. 
होता है so far so far i i you know i i like i said maybe it maybe it's my bias that that um doesn't allow me to see a a, a combination you know that that but it, it just doesn't when it doesn't seem to jibe in my head and again my bias is um is probably very strong and and uh you know but again it, it, that's my working model right now i reserve the right to change it next week if i see something unusual but so far i i just i just haven't seen anything that it's it it's nothing has thrown me off to that degree where i'm going oh this is a combination that i haven't seen before and, and again i might see i might call you up next week and go hey patrick guess what i saw one you know i i don't know i don't know i i i can't reason my way through it right now but maybe i'm just not smart enough to do so um there's actually one at one of the basketball players on the team like i didn't really like put him on the table and measure his infrastructure angle but it seems really narrow like when i look at it it looks really narrow but really he's tall. like the was it shirt off he's really tall yeah he's super tall he's like six he's like six ten plays like backup center starting power forward mm -hmm. but um yeah he but he's like the best athlete on the team and he's never really mentioned any sort of pain um, nobody said you have to have pain brother so in that case would you like adjust try to intervene on its personal angle or would you why that's my follow up i mean uh, what what what's the goal what 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 is, is he capable of doing something that you want him to be able to do hello oh sorry i was muted by the host nope <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't hear Bill. <laughs> um, no, I, again, it's it's like, is there something that he can't do that you want him to be able to do? The the only, I mean, it, it doesn't. The, these things don't make things wrong. They just show you what is. And then, if something needs to change, do I need to induce variability into a system? Then I might need to make some changes. If I don't need to, then if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And maybe it's just something that you monitor, and maybe it's something that you manage, right? Um, to to provide some variability. So maybe maybe he only needs it, you know, to to work on something that influences that aspect uh, to allow him to rest a little bit better, or to recover a little bit better, or, uh, you know, again, we've got what? How how tall is Mabor? Is seven feet tall? It's like I'm not going to change that in first terminal angle, you know. I mean, he's seven feet tall. That's a management strategy right there. There's there, he doesn't have a choice. It's like when you know if if I'm going to build a tower that's a hundred feet tall, and I'm not going to give it any guy wires, you know, to keep it stable uh, over its very narrow base. What is it going to do? Well, it's going to try to lock itself into a, one plane you know, as often as it can to, to, to provide management. But we also have, you know, a, a seven footer that can do a deep squat down to his heels and, and, and shows tremendous control. And, and so there's nothing wrong with him. Like I said, just when he's, you know, his, his vestibular system is seven feet off the ground. He just has to have a management strategy to be able to control himself. It doesn't mean he can't change. Now, if I got somebody that's like that and they can't change at all, and now they're going to put some stress on some stuff. Now, maybe I need to in intervene. So again, it, you know, wide, narrow, it doesn't make it right, doesn't make it wrong. It just tells you what is. Got it. I was expecting that. I was just curious. Well, then you get to do the Q and A next next month, okay? <laughs> um, I had a question. Hey, um, shocker! <laughs> I just didn't want to like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let someone else go. No, no, dude, dude. I love having you on because because you always you always do ask good questions, but you're developing a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Better to be remembered, I guess. Go ahead, man. Um, what is your philosophy on, um, I guess, working with someone in pain? Like, would you, like, for example, would you think would it be appropriate to say? To, for someone who has like pain with like front squatting, knee pain or back pain with front squatting, to have them try like an elevated trap bar deadlift, 
and I mean, you know, right away you're 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 coming up with an alternative strategy to something that that is that is that is painful, right? I have no idea why they have pain, nor do you, right? We just know that when they do something like that, they're they're painful. The the question is, is does does do they experience it elsewhere? It's like I don't take things away from people until I have to. It's like, you know, the 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 uh, unfortunate information that that some medic, medical practitioners will give somebody is like they they come and say, oh, you know, my knee kind of hurts when I do this. And they go, oh, well, don't ever squat. It's like, well, I didn't tell you that it hurt when it squat. It hurts when I do something else. And they'll say, well, you definitely don't squat because it'll be bad for you. It's like I, I don't I don't have that attitude because they may be perfectly fine to do a trap bar deadlift, whereas they may do something either mechanically or they lack something that allows them to execute a, a front squat without without discomfort, whereas they can do a trap bar deadlift till the cows come home and they might be perfectly fine. Now, that doesn't mean that you negate your, your coaching eye, right? I mean, you still gotta you know, get your eyes on them and you make that decision based on your understanding and your experiences as to what what falls into your you know, your uh, uh, view of what is a good trap bar deadlift, right? So again, you, you may not want them to uh, sacrifice an element of technique. And if you see something that, that you don't like, then maybe you still don't do the trap bar deadlift just out of, out of safety reasons. But, um, you know, I have no problem with, with, with an alternative exercise as a strategy. I think it's a great, it's a great first strategy because again, all you're doing is you're making a, you're making a judgment. It's like, okay, the front squat was painful. Let's not be stupid and let's not continue with the front squat because I don't know why you have pain, but I don't like you having that. That that could just be a warning signal or it could be something. But when you do a trap bar deadlift and it's totally pain free and it's totally within my guidelines as to what I consider a good trap bar deadlift, go right ahead. Did Patrick disappear? I was wondering who disappeared. Yeah, he did. He must not have liked your answer. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to repeat that when he comes back on. Oh, man. Poor, poor California internet. Um, I like your point. Uh, what, here's a little follow-up. What if uh, they seem to not be, not be comfortable with doing anything but a trap bar deadlift? Are you okay with putting that in repeatedly? Why not? What if they... Um, Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Let's suppose that you're working with an Olympic weightlifter and they really like to front squat. Are you going to take that away at some point in time? I mean, would you stop front squatting an Olympic weightlifter? No. Nah. What does it matter? You know, there are infinite number of ways to vary things. And, you know, change their stance a little bit if you need some variation on a theme if they like to trap our deadlift why not leave it in you can tell a power lifter not to not to deadlift and not to squat or not to bench press i mean there might be periods where they don't but but again it's like it's an element of what they do um you know there how many sets of trap bar deadlifts do you think they're doing in a lifetime compared to all other activities do you really think that that you know, a, a four week phase of trap bar deadlifts is, well, that's way too much. If we go any longer than that, that's a bad idea. It's like, you could do that for years. It wouldn't matter, right? They're doing a lot of other stuff. So, you know, if, if all they ever do is sit in a chair all day long and then go trap bar deadlift and then they sit in the chair the rest of the time, then maybe you might have a problem. But, you know, let's be reasonable here. You know, four sets of five in the trap bar deadlift, was that 20 reps? Um, you know, once a week for you know five years no big deal right so totally you know how might you uh address it if they said if they if they have this i don't like this perception that it's supposed to change not even necessarily that they're getting bored of it but that they feel like they're not progressing how would you address that um when you say that that it's, it's supposed to change. You mean, you mean they think they need to change exercises? Yes, that's what I mean. And you don't want to? Correct. Change the exercise. Perfect. Make, make the client, however, make the client happy. 
But but that doesn't mean you, you need to change from a trap bar to head to left. Like I said, you can change the stance a little bit. You can change the height a little bit. You know, um, instead of putting the big wheels on the trap bar dead left, hey, put it down a little bit lower or maybe elevate it a little bit. You know, you can there's a lot of variation on the theme here um, that, that you can play with. And, and so you can change it without changing it. Right. Repetition without repetition. Sometimes I just like to say. Um, no, you know, we changed your, your sets and reps a lot now. So we're, we're addressing something totally different. Like, I'm not just going to have you do three by 15 for the rest of your life, but there's always right. something that changes. Right. And then, and then, you know, the, there's the discussion that you can have that, that, you know, you've only been doing this for four weeks. You're going to get better at the exercise. Let's go ahead and change the sets and reps or let's change your rest period or let's put it in a different place in your workout or whatever, 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 and allow you to continue to get better at the exercise. And now you're going to draw even more benefit from that exercise three months from now when you are a great trap bar deadlifter and you're no longer thinking about your technique. And now you're going to get really, really strong because you don't have to think about how to do it. You're just executing. And now your 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 system can can intensify um, what we're intending to to achieve in the first place. I like that a lot. Yeah, I think, I think there's too much variation in exercises in a lot of programs because I think that that people change because they get bored of an exercise, but then they don't get good at it. And then if they don't get good at it, then they don't lift a lot of heavy weight. And then they wonder why they don't make progress because the body has nothing to adapt to other than the exercise. Now there's no physiological adaptations that, that they're, you know, or physiological demands that are, that are uh, promoting the adaptation for change anyway. I love it so much. <laughs> Sorry, Bill, my, my computer shut off as you were talking to me. We, uh, so, so here's what you missed. It was, it was like the best question ever. And, and I think I gave an answer that wins the internet for the next 10 years, but I'm not going to repeat it for you. And <laughs> no, actually Lance called it that, that you had the California internet going. And so, so somebody probably took it away from you. So I said, my computer told me that I had 20% battery left and then I grabbed my charger but I didn't want to inter move away as you were talking, so I was just, I, I figured I had enough time, and then it just been shut off. You're a polite dude, I appreciate that. <laughs> but um, let's say that you you gave some uh, same client trap bar deadlift for four weeks, and then it got stronger. Would you then consider reintroducing a front squat? Sure. Why not? You know, if if everything else is going as planned, right? You're going to have to test it, right? If, if, if the front squat is definitely something that you feel is necessary, you know, and, and you want to include it or they want to include it, or you feel, again, there's, there's some sort of benefit from it, how are you going to know, right? And, that may, and maybe, you, maybe you do a little bit of a progression kind of a thing. Maybe you just say, okay, let's look at some sort of, you know, more simplified squat variation. So you do a goblet squat and then you do a zercher squat and then you do a double kettlebell front squat and that all goes well. And then you put the bar on their shoulders and you say, okay, now let's try that. So maybe that's how you approach it. But I'm okay with you just going ahead. If, if they are, they've been proficient in a front squat in the past, I'm okay with you just going to the front squat and just kind of going, okay, what happens? Cause you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe, maybe it's perfect. Maybe everything goes exactly as you want, you know? But again, let me restate that you want to err on the side of caution if they've had pain in the past. Okay. And the last question, um, I'm just curious to ask, what is, like, how do you like to, to, what's your description of what pain is? What is pain? Um, pain is an output designed to protect you from something. So like when you meet that girl and she dumps you and it hurts really bad, it's okay. It's supposed to hurt. Um, no, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a signal, right? But it, but it doesn't, it, 
it doesn't have an absolute meaning. It doesn't mean that something is damaged. It doesn't mean that something is broken. It just means it's something that you really need to pay attention to. The brains thought it was so important for you to recognize this, that it said, hey, um, I'm going to give you the most unpleasant sensation right now. So you go, uh, what was that? And then quit doing that. Right? And then we go from there. Um, and and that's, that's the most generic answer I can give you right now because I don't know, you know, any specifics. And most of the time, to be honest with you, I have no idea why people have pain anyway. Right? I just don't. And we can say that we do or say that we don't all day long, but in reality, I don't think we do. It's, 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 a, it's a very complex phenomenon, right? It's, it's, it's like, why do some people get tired during a drill and some people don't, right? Fatigue is the same. Fatigue is a, is a very, very similar output. It's there to protect you because it's not that you're exhausted of energy, right? It just means that, that the accumulation of, of byproducts from your activity are signaling the brain and the brain is going, okay, well, what's this? This seems dangerous. So now my legs might burn. Well, there's pain. Or it just says, you're really, really tired now. I need you to stop because I don't know if this is going to kill you or not. Right? So there's a lot of things that are like that. Right? We always, we have salience detectors in our nervous system. Right? So our, our uh, what, A delta and C fibers, those are the, the nociceptors, right? Are you familiar with some of that? Yeah, so they sense a lot of different things. They, they, sense, they sense the difference in water content in your, in your cells, for God's sakes. I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? But, but what is, what is, why, why would we sense that and sense something that, that would eventually be perceived as pain because all that is is salience. It's just importance. It's just something for, to, to keep track of. And, and so that's what those, those cells do for us. And then the brain makes an interpretation and then you spit out a behavior and sometimes it's pain and sometimes it's fatigue and sometimes it's, you know, setting a world record. So I don't know. Long answer to the question. <laughs> yeah. I figured that it would be, that would, be quite an answer how do you explain it to someone then how do you explain like let's say that they have back to my example they have pain, pain with the squat but then they'll have pain with the deadlift the strap bar deadlift it's like the same movement. Say, say you don't don't know but we're not going to do that again and until it doesn't hurt it just this it, it's just like i said it's a warning signal that something needs to be attended to that's all it means you know it doesn't mean anything bad doesn't mean that, that, that they're wrong you're wrong or or anything's broken, you just don't know. And so maybe you, maybe you need to reevaluate their capabilities. Maybe you need to just pick a better exercise, right? And so then it becomes a matter of, okay, which strategy do I apply first? Okay, what's the safest thing to do right now, right? In case something goes wrong, what's the safest thing that, that I can do that if something does go wrong, nobody really gets hurt, right? Because you gotta protect them first. You got to protect them from themselves because a lot of people will just try to push themselves, right? And you've seen that too, I'm sure. Definitely, especially with, definitely with athletes. They don't even care sometimes. Yeah. They have pain. But no, they expect it. See, that's the difference between athletes and, and the, the normal population is that athletes are so used to feeling discomfort that they associate it with a, with a good feeling, right? You know, ask a bodybuilder, you know, on, on their 25th rep of, of – you know, ask the grass squats with 315 in the bar, how comfortable it is. And they'll say, oh, it was horrible. It was like the best set I've ever done. You know, it's like, what, what is that? Thanks, Bill. You're welcome, sir. Thanks for being here, man. Anybody else? Who we got on here? Alex, no, are you there, bud? You got anything for me this week? I'll ask a question. Fire away. So I won't, I won't use like the model's name or anything. So I, I like uh, just a performance model that talks about like resets and using what seemed to be like very noxious stimulus to almost drive like this polyvagal response. I got you. Um, yeah, I mean, you probably know what I'm talking about. But if you're, if you're driving this like dorsal vagal kind of response, 
and you're getting a motor change, or like you're trying to use it for some sort of motor skill acquisition, is that like too costly or is that not going to work in the long run? I, I don't know the answer to that. I wonder if you had any sort of input. I, you know, I don't know either. Um, I, I, the, the only issue that I have is, is the um, application of it in general, I think. Um, hmm. So there's, there's some familiarity to what, and, and I've only seen a couple of videos on this. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm horribly uninformed. Okay. I have some of the material. I'll send it to you uh, after this okay. if you'd like. Yeah. That, that, I, and I, I will look at it. But the but, yeah. but point being is, it's like just, just from observations. And, and again, I, I, I saw a treatment video. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't the one with the kids that were, you know. Doing it on themselves. And then doing some stuff. Which um, I don't know if it actually would do anything if it needs to be that threatening to begin with. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And, yeah. and who's, who's to say if it's right or wrong? I mean, people still foam roll for some reason, but. Um, Feels uh, good, man. Well, or it doesn't. Or it yeah. doesn't. Feel good, and then they, they say, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, if, you get, if, if, if it works, you know. But so there's, there's some similarities between an osteopathic technique um, and, and some of that stuff. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's what it looks like to me. Uh, I, I think I, I could see some utility in something like that. If like, say I had a sprinter and I wanted them to run faster in like in a very acute sense. Right. But no. maybe, but doing it over and over again for an athlete in like a general way, I, I feel like you're just, you're, you're pushing it. Like you're asking for a problem. Or, or they're just going to accommodate to it and, and then whatever f acute effect that you had initially yeah. is going to be gone. You know, it's kind of like, all right, how many times can you yell at somebody to motivate them? You know, at some point you're going to become desensitized to it. And, and, and that would be, you know, another concern. It's like, well, you know, you just get desensitized to all this stuff. And that's why, some people like stuff for a while and then they kind of throw it out of their routine and then, you know, they, they become resensitized to it and then they bring it back in and then, Oh, I remember when this used to feel like this and it was good. And then they do it for a while and then it disappears again. It's like, we, you know, we go through these things all the time. Um, you know, and, and whether it stays in, in, in our realm or not, who, who knows, I don't really care at this point. I, I haven't utilized it. I'm not going to waste my time on it right now. I think there's other things that are probably more valuable that have a greater meaning that we have maybe a smaller, um, uh, more beneficial understanding of, you know, I don't think we understand a whole lot of anything that we do, but, but we try really hard. And I just don't think it's worth my time nor anyone's time really to, to spend a lot of time on it. Um, and that's not to take away what these guys are trying to do. I'm sure that their intention is, is admirable as in most cases. I just yeah. don't know how valuable it is, um, especially with a limited understanding of what is really happening. You know, yeah. um, it's, it's, I, just don't want, I just don't want people to hurt other people. Yeah. I mean, I'm in that boat too, but it seems to be like they're selling it as a performance model. So, but I, I think people, you know, it's like handing a loaded gun to a toddler sometimes. Like people would just try to use it for everything. Yeah. They become like enamored with it. I, and that scares me a little bit, I guess. But it, it, it'll, probably, it'll probably cycle like most things do where, where, you know, it has that initial level of novelty that, that draws people in and then they'll use it for a little while and then it'll kind of like fade away or it'll find its place if it does have some sort of value or, you know, it, 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 you know, I don't know. I just, like I said, it, it's, there's, I think there's so many other things that, that are, are a greater benefit yeah. that I just don't want to spend any time on it. You know? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Do you have an example of something that is worth more time? Yeah. How about knowing where stuff goes, like, like where the attachment sites of muscles are and then, how they change when you move and how the, the physics of movement changes when you move, because, you know, something is, as simple, or simply, or it appears as simple um, as dead guy anatomy doesn't apply when you stand up and when you bend and when you squat and 
when you lunge and twist and reach and push and pull because stuff changes position and then therefore the the purpose of of those um muscles changes and and the capabilities of those muscles changes and that is infinitely more important than me digging a knuckle into some part of your body and you know trying to elicit a response that way because then I make better choices as I'm coaching somebody or maybe I can identify um, some form of uh, aberrant movement that I just don't want to see and maybe I can give a better cue or maybe I can provide them a better sensation or whatever. Um, you know, I think that's infinitely more important. Do you have any recommendations on how other people who maybe aren't around you can learn that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's like lots of books and stuff. Um, the the problem is that there's not one, you know, and that that's you know everybody wants like what's the if you could only buy one book what would it be and it's like well I wouldn't I wouldn't buy that book. Uh, a lot of it is is first knowing where things are and then you know a, a lot can be achieved by. Um, looking at it right and saying okay if i move in this certain way this attachment moves away from this one or the angle changes here and so what does that mean to this muscle right what what does it change about it so if you let's just look at like uh um okay the the so-called deep external rotators of the hip right okay so if i'm a dead guy laying on a slab and somebody yanks on one of those muscles and it externally rotates the hip, right? So I'm laying face down in the slab. Somebody grabs my little piriformis because somebody always has to pick on piriformis because it's such a bad little muscle, right? And, and, and so you pull on that and it externally rotates it. They go, oh, that's an external rotator. Well, okay, what if I flex that hip um, to approximately 90 degrees? Now what happens to that muscle when I pull on it? Well, wait a minute. No, it internally rotates the hip. No, it's an internal rotator wait a minute, how could that be? It was an external rotator when I was laying on the slab, um, you know, a minute ago, and then you bent my hip and now it, so what changed? So you just changed the moment. So now we have to understand physics a little bit as far as like, you know, what that means. But, but in general, it's like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. It's like, I got to put you in a different position. And it's like, now when this muscle does pull, cause that's what they do, what does it actually do for me? Right not just concentrically, but eccentrically and isometrically, and then concentrically at one end and eccentrically at the other, or isometrically at both ends, or, or you know, concentrically at both ends. And so we have to consider all these things because, you know, when we learn these things in school, we, we have a very limited view because it's a very difficult concept to digest because of the level of complexity. And so they simplify the model to make it understandable. And, and, but, but what we need to understand is that all these muscles are functioning in three planes all at the same time. They change their, the position of their attachments and therefore their purpose changes and their capabilities change. And so that's the stuff that you just spend time on. But I think a lot of it can be done once you know where kind of stuff kind of is and then you understand how things move. Right. So then you understand the, the type of joint that you're dealing with and what are the, the capabilities of that joint. Right. What does the hip joint do compared to the shoulder joint, compared to the knee joint? What movements are they capable of? What are the degrees of freedom? Right. And then how do these muscles influence those degrees of freedom? And if I bend the knee, what happens, you know, to the to the uh, the hamstring attachment or, or we pull out an intern question and we say, OK, when you're standing up, give me the. Uh, Give me the, the knee extender that doesn't cross the knee. And now you got to figure that one out. It's like, okay, that, that's a nice little question to ask. And it starts to make you think about, oh, this is how anatomy really works. Instead of the dead guy laying on the slab and, and having, you know, the, the, uh, the guys, um, you know, in the, the uh, before the year zero that were figuring all this stuff out, right? I love that because I, like, I don't, I've been trying to find a good answer for that because there's no clear cut. You can't just read this book. You can't just take this course. You can't even take this series of courses. It just won't give it to you. You just have to keep going. And yeah. Corey, back and, and here, you know I've been having him do stuff. And, he's and just, I'm just like, when you finish that book, start the next one. Yeah. 
and you and and honestly it's like but 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 and, and you've heard me say this before it's like it's like that the learning occurs at the point of struggle it's like this is where you really start to get it though right if if you think you know anatomy and you're and you've got a master's degree in anatomy and and i think that that what what that has allowed you to achieve is an understanding of I really don't know much about anatomy because it is so complex, right? I mean, you just got exposed to this, this deeper and deeper level and it's infinite how deep the complexity can go. And, and unfortunately there's not one source. And, and so you just, you work through it and you learn something and then you apply it and then that becomes locked in and integrated into your, your understanding or whatever, you know, system or process you use. And then you, you're right. You just go to the next step. You say, you, which book do I read next? The, the next one, just grab the next one on the shelf. It's like, that's what you have to do. And then now you have an analogy to work from and, and to learn from. And, and that's how you learn is you just build on this. And I'm not saying that dead guy anatomy is a bad thing. You know, it, it, I, you got to start somewhere, right? I just got to know where stuff is. And, and, but we can't accept that, you know, when, when you're reading a, 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 a well-researched kinesiology text and they don't get past the dead guy anatomy, it's not very valuable to the guy that has to train somebody in the gym. You know, it ceases to be valuable very early on. And unfortunately, like I said, there's not, there's not a source yet. I just like, I don't know how, how big that book would be. Like, what could you do? I, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't, I mean, you know, pick, pick, pick any muscle with, with like, like a goofy looking penation angle and then just start to pick that one apart. It's like, okay. So uh, vastus medialis, right? Okay. Well, everybody wants to call it a knee extender, but why does it have oblique fibers? And they say, well, it stabilizes the patella or it moves the patella this way. But you know what? If you put your foot on the ground, it becomes an external rotator of the hip. Oh, really? Well, that's an interesting one. Never really thought about that one. Um, so, you know, it, it's like stuff like that is, is the stuff that, that we miss because it's just not considered you know, across the board as, as the, the, the normal understanding of how these things work. You know, trying to get somebody to understand that a muscle can function concentrically at one joint and eccentrically at the other joint when it happens all the time. I mean, do a chin up for God's sakes. And, and you'll, you'll see stuff like this, this happen as people attempt to do the chin up. It's like they, they move concentrically at one end and the other end's going eccentric because they can't they don't know how to control it but it does happen it happens all the time um so you know I, I wish there was a resource like that but i don't i don't know i think that it, it would just be like one of these things that comes out of discussion more than anything else because it, it requires a little bit of you know thought experimentation and it's like okay so i find that i tell you who does that really well and 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 he's probably one of those dudes that gets misunderstood a lot um, um is gary gray um, and, and I, I don't, I, I think some of his stuff is incredibly confusing. And, and I think there's sometimes that we should get Scott Gray on here sometime. He's a, he's a, uh, I think he's a credential dude with, with Gary Gray's thing. I'm going to talk to him in a, in a week or so, I think anyway. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but he's a dude that, that, you know, if you watch some of his resources from the past, we would say, okay, I'm going to be a Dr. Magnus. So if I'm a Dr. Magnus, I'm attached here and here. And when I do this activity, I'm in this position. And when I do this activity, I'm in this position. And so he does a really neat job of, of, of breaking things down in that respect. But I think some of his stuff is hard to follow if you don't have um, any prior exposure to, to that type of thinking. So, so in that respect, I do like, I do like to listen to him. He's a fun guy to listen to. Um, but like I said, I don't, I don't think I agree with anybody, you know, in everything, but, but, um, I think it's worth, you know, the exposure to his, his, uh, perspective in that regard. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I was, that was the only other thing I wanted to add was that sometimes it's not from books. I think the most that I've gotten is just understanding some of the basic dead guy stuff and then thinking through it and reasoning and making a, a little model in my head or even, you know, playing with a, an actual physical model. 
Yeah, you, so you, you take the skeleton and you take a piece of TheraBand and you, you beat the muscle and then you say, okay, what is it doing under this circumstance? Okay, what if I move these two attachments further and further apart? What happens to it? What if I twist it this way? What if I twist it that way? And that's kind of how you figure out a lot of these things, right? And, and But you can understand, it's like, okay, there's a lot of different influences. You know, the difference between having your, your foot on the ground and not having your foot on the ground or having your hand down or having it stabilized or pushing against a heavy load versus a light load, there's a difference. And, and all of these things matter, right? But you just take it one piece at a time and then you slowly integrate it. I love it. Who's got another question? We got nine minutes. Dang, that went fast. Kevin. Yes, sir. Who's Kevin? There he is. Hi, Kevin. Hey. hey. So, um, got a volleyball player slash dancer that we're working with, and this is out of a, a PT clinic. Um, seen her for some totally unrelated, but she is super, super hyperextended, super lordotic, uh, maxes out like the biting scale, that kind of stuff. Um, how, how optimistic would you be in trying to work with her and kind of correct some of that stuff while she is maintaining all these other activities? So like, but I have no control over like, Hey, you need to shut down volleyball. You need to shut down dance. And, you know, getting her in the clinic twice a week and then trying to get her to follow up at home, like, you know, it's like try to do as much as I can and she seems to be on board, but it's like, okay, am I, am I really, how uphill of a battle is that? Well, I think you, I think, I think you've got a pretty major challenge ahead of you. You know, it, if you don't have the buy-in from, I mean, the first thing, and first and foremost, she's got to buy into what you're, what you're selling, you know, and, right. and, and the, you know, maybe providing her a little bit of understanding goes a long way in that regard. Um, that, that's what I try to do. I try, I mean, and, and I, I know a lot of times that I, I probably talk too much, um, you know, with the patient, but I'd rather talk a little too much than not enough and, and try to give them as much information and, and, and give them some semblance of an understanding of, of what they're facing so they do buy in and so they do follow through. And, and I think, I think we, we do okay in that respect, but, uh, um, that's first and foremost. It's like if she doesn't see a reason to do this and she's just showing up and killing time, then you're screwed, right? I mean, there's, sure. there's nothing you can do about uh, right. to help her. You know, if you can't control anything on the outside, then, you know, it, it just comes down to, okay, what, where do I have an influence? Right. I mean, maybe you have to narrow your intentions to, okay, pick my, my biggest number one impactful thing that will, you know, have the greatest influence across the board. And maybe you go after one thing. Right. 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 And a lot of times that's what you have to do. You just have to narrow it down. It's like, you know, it's, it's fu funny. And I'm sure you've seen this too, where you get the, the patients that they come in and say, well, here's, here's my home exercises that the other guy gave me. And there's like 17 pages of exercises and there's six exercises on a page. It's like, right. well, how long does it take you to get through this? And it's like, oh, I, I do it twice a day and it only takes four hours. And it's like, well, what do you do the rest of your life? Um, you know, so if, if, you, can, if you can look at, at, at her and, and say, okay, considering all these activities, and if you can find out what she's doing, and, and maybe provide her some information as to, okay, we can actually use what you're doing to help us do this as long as she's attentive to certain cues. And maybe that's how you build out from the one thing, right? Right. How you expand. Um, but, but, but I think that, they, like I said, first and foremost, get buy-in. Number two, get the one thing. Number three, find out what the heck she's doing elsewhere and see if you can just take advantage of that. I think that, that that's going to give you some um, – some shot at, at being successful. Okay. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I guess, I guess that kind of goes into, I, so the clinic that I'm at, uh, their kind of foundation is, is more off the PRI principles are pretty heavy into that. I'm coming into that as a relative newbie into that. And I guess that's one of the things with it. I'm still trying to wrap my head around with that is some of the, I guess the dose response on that. Um, and that like, Hey, you know, we, we put people on the table, they, you know, they're positive for these tests. We do this 90, 90 hip lift, they're neutral, but I can either get them to take a big breath in or get up and walk across the floor and, and put them back on the table and, and they're right back out of position. So I guess I'm, and I see it and I see it consistently, but I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around 
how like you go do these two exercises and this somehow is influencing yep. the other 23 hours of the day where you're not really paying attention to this. So, okay. So, so all you're doing, all you're doing is you're trying to get the system to learn something different. Okay. It's not like, it's, it's like every other activity. Don't let's not overcomplicate this part. Okay. The, the, you know, the, the way that you're influencing it goes through a very complicated process, but we don't necessarily control that. All you're trying to do with any activity that you give any other human being on any level is that system is trying to learn something new. And so that's the goal. Now, there's another, another rule that I know you're familiar with, and that's called graded exposure, right? And right. so that's all you're doing. That's all you're doing is graded exposure. So, so the, the number one rule that, that we always talk about at IFAST is that we always want to put people in a, in a position to be successful. And so that's where you're starting. So you put them in a position where you know they can be successful. And then they can make the changes that you want. All right? Step one. Step two, get really, really good at that. Right. So now right. they you're going to send them away. You say, go do your stuff. Come back in whatever time that, that you choose. And, and it's like, okay, when you walk back in the door, I want some of my measurements to be better in, in, in your perspective, whatever better means. Right. And so if they improve, now you got to increase the complexity of the activity, graded exposure. I got to make it a little bit harder for you because I got it because one, if it's not hard enough, they don't learn anything. If it's too easy, they don't learn anything. If it's right. too hard, they don't learn anything. So, so we got to find that sweet spot again. So now you got to pick the next exercise, right? You say, okay, this exercise is harder than this one. You do this. Okay. Now recheck your test. What happened? Was it a good thing or was it a bad thing? Well, if it was a bad thing and it made it made all the tests go bad, then it's probably too hard, right? If it, if it, was too easy and it didn't make the changes that you want, then it wasn't hard enough. So you got to find the sweet spot that welcome to science, right? This is, this is scientific method. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with, with trial and error. You've got a process to follow and that's all you have to do. But, but just look at it from the graded exposure perspective, because that's all we do with anything. It's like you put somebody in the gym and, you know, I'm going to train them to, 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 you know, support their ability to play basketball. It's like, I'm doing the same thing. Right. Right. It's just like it's just a little different process um, in regards to to the execution of of what you're doing, right? Whereas you know in, in the rehab realm, we're trying to increase their the variability of their entire system because we have right. no idea where the variability needs to go. We try to figure it out. We do the best we can, but honestly, we don't know where that is. And then when we take them out in the gym, we're narrowing variability. Right. We can't make them great at everything. We're just going to try to make them great at the things that they need the most. And that's all you're doing with your patient. It's like, what does she need the most? There's your point of impact. How do I get that? Well, I can give her some stuff that she might want to do. Great. What is she already doing that might help us out? Let's try to influence that the next best, you know, the right. uh, next best level that we can. Okay. Cool. Appreciate it. You said she's a volleyball and a dancer. <laughs> yeah that's a wicked combination man yeah yeah oh man yeah. Well, good uh, luck yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's tough that's tough it's awesome awesome um i will so we've got one more minute bill do you have any uh final thoughts i thought that was a, a pretty good wrap there uh final thoughts final thoughts what have i been thinking about today um let's see first ribs interesting yeah yeah hey when you can't figure out what something does change the position so uh if you don't know what the upper rib cage does for a living stand on your hands and uh you'll find out a lot of things it's pretty cool anyway just a thought I like that it's kind of ominous and we can just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Now I think, you know, it, 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 the, the, the point that we made about anatomy, I think is, is, is like the, the take home tonight, right? It's like, we just don't know a lot of stuff and, and there's not a lot of complete references anywhere. And, and as much as we want to, you know, talk about, well, I'm basing this off evidence or whatever, um, you know, the, the research is, is typically driven by the practitioners. We do stuff, we experiment, we try things. Um, and then we try to be, you know, we try to follow the sciences as much as we can. 
Um, but but there, there are so many incompletes out there. Um, you know, as long as we're safe with people, um, we, we just have to keep figuring things out one step at a time. And, and everybody's going to learn, you know, differently at different paces and, and put things together differently and see perspectives. And, and we just need to keep sharing that stuff and, and keep questioning things and, and keep asking questions and trying to answer them. And then when we think we got them, then ask yourself the question all over again and try to solve it in a different way. There's just too much complexity in this to, to, to say, oh, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that's the advantage I have of being old now is, is that, uh, you know, when I was 25 and I knew everything, um, I, have a, I have a much greater perspective for and, and appreciation of, of how complex all this stuff really is. Beautiful. You've inspired Casey to check his first rib. He was doing handstands while you were making your poignant points. Seriously? <laughs> Can you do like a real handstand? Where is he? Here, I got you. Can you do a real handstand? <laughs> this is intern Casey. Let's oh, see. He's doing Casey. <laughs> <laughs> Did that fall? Oh, this is going well. This is, uh, it's because it's, you know, after 9.30, he can't really operate. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That's, those are some long legs, too. Whew. All right, I'm done. We, I got to eat. <laughs> Guys, thanks for coming in. Um, bring, I, good questions, guys. Good we're questions. Applauding. Yeah, thanks, really good. Guys. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for see bringing us. <laughs> hey, uh, see you guys next month. Uh, feel free. This is going to be free, so feel free to share it up. Uh, have a good one.